Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming to our talk on the problems introduced by child sexual abuse detection algorithms. My name is Tatiana Ringenberg, and I will be presenting today in conjunction with my collaborators, Lorraine Kisselberg and Jean Camp. Child sexual abuse is a domain which has grown in both quantity and complexity. During COVID-19, reports of child sexual abuse increased by more than 30% for both online and physical offenses. To combat this issue, large tech companies have begun to develop products or policies intended to protect the safety of children. While we agree it is necessary to combat this influx of child crime, we see a gap with respect to considerations around the impact to the data privacy and safety of child sexual abuse survivors, as well as society as a whole. So in this presentation, we are going to use the example of Apple's expanded protections for children to illustrate the current concerns around such technologies. So over the past year or so, Apple has introduced three forms of protections for children. The first is parental controls which censor nude images being sent from or to a minor's device. The second is guidance on seeking help for child sexual, sexual abuse, which would be available through multiple Apple tools, include, including Siri, Spotlight, and Safari Search. The third and most publicly controversial to date is the neural hash algorithm for detecting known child sexual abuse images in the cloud. Through machine learning, the algorithm was to detect images harmful um, to children that existed in a database for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, um, which had potentially been cropped or modified from the original images. Once this reached a certain threshold of images, uh, the images would be decrypted and verified by Apple before being reported to authorities. This algorithm was delayed this year and has been removed from their site. Apple's child protection solutions have come under scrutiny due to political, technical, and social implications. From a political perspective, researchers have expressed concern around the neural hash algorithm in that it breaks the privacy stance that Apple has championed for years. Additionally, it sets a precedent for future collaborations with government agencies. From a technical perspective, researchers and practitioners are concerned about breaking of end-to-end -end encryption, modification of the existing database, and potential for adversarial collisions with the hashes from the database. Finally, from a social perspective, it's unclear that the harms that are introduced and removed through, uh, it's unclear which harms are introduced and removed through Apple's solution. For instance, Parental notification of nude images could have severe consequences for minors, depending on their family structure and beliefs. Additionally, while consumption of child sexual abuse materials can be an indicator of abuse, it is not always. By targeting individuals with pre-existing images, Apple is specifically targeting consumers and not necessarily the producers or distributors of such content. Additionally, they may not be capturing individuals who are soliciting or enticing children. So it's unclear how the specific type of crime and the material was chosen for child protection and whether or not it will have the biggest impact to safety for children. Good morning, everyone. Afternoon. Um, so what we want to talk about is what can we do to address some of these implications? And we know that there's very significant focus on identifying and prosecuting the perpetrators of the crime. But what we don't know as well is that CSAM detection technology triggers very intense privacy concerns for the survivors, in addition to concerns about data security. And we think this requires design and review practices that bring greater attention to the ethical risk. And it centers the voices and expertise of the survivors in the design process. And that means including stakeholders, such as the survivors and victim advocates, social scientists, as well as privacy engineers and law enforcement experts. So we suggest that we can actually find help by leveraging some of the ethical principles that are set forth, and in this case, ACM is one example, their code of ethics and their 2018 statement on preserving privacy, and leverage those to analyze the risk of proposed systems and emphasize the values, as the panel was just talking about before us, that drive good privacy design. So the ACM Code of Ethics includes two overarching ethical principles, among many others, that I think is helpful in this case. 
The first, among the first, is avoid harm, a principle that is um, well known to everyone. And it states in part, and I quote, well-intended actions, including those that accomplish assigned duties, may lead to harm. And when that harm is unintended, those responsible are obliged to undo or mitigate the harm as much as possible. And avoiding harm begins with a careful consideration of potential impacts on all those affected by decisions. And the second one, of course, is respect privacy. And it states that the responsibility of respecting privacy applies to computing professionals who should only use personal information for legitimate ends and without violating the rights of individuals. And it also warns about the risk of re-identification of anonymized data, unauthorized data collection, and unauthorized access and accidental disclosure. So specifically, more specifically, there are a set of 10 principles that were published by ACM in 2018 uh, from the US Technology Policy Committee regarding the protection of privacy. And we think this can also help guide design and oversight. So many of these principles are familiar to you probably, and they're um, mentioned by many others who have done something similar, including fairness, accountability, and transparency. And they've subsequently been encoded into international policy instruments from OECD, endorsed by international government leaders from the G7 and G20. And I'd like to highlight just four of those pretty quickly to illustrate some of the specific privacy issues that are raised by the CSAM case. The first is transparency. So the transparency principle is very important in drawing attention to the need for very clear information in the collection and use of personal data, including to whom it may be disclosed and why. However, while this level of detailed transparency is necessary, such disclosures might occur in an environment where sharing the consent itself, excuse me, sharing the content itself can be harmful. For example, notifying parents and disclosing images can place teens at harm if they're in a, a violent environment. The second principle regarding individual control, of course, is grounded essentially in the ethic of autonomy. And it's important in drawing attention to the rights of the individual to consent to the use of their data, as well as to specify the limits and restriction on how their data is collected, shared, and transferred. And in the case of CSAM, detection system, this includes de our decisions about how and to whom authorities can share images of individuals, or even whether these images can be stored in a database for indexing future abuse. And in the Apple case, they proposed to notify parents about material that was discovered, creating, as I mentioned earlier, significant harms and violations of privacy, and even the risk of punishment from those parental guardians. The next principle has to do with data security, and it provides important guidelines for protecting against loss and misuse, as well as unauthorized disclosure. And it advises continuous auditing of access, use, and the maintenance of data. But the CSAM case illustrates another important consideration here, and that's the very act of creating and storing databases for suspected CSAM material creates a harmful risk to the security of individuals, depending upon who is given authorized access to the data. For example, in nations uh, with authoritarian regimes, they can enforce mandates and include images that are deemed politically offensive for identification and incarceration of those ind individuals. Nations in theocratic uh, regimes may use authorized access to repress information related to women's reproductive health. So the last pair of principles that I mentioned very quickly have to do with accountability and risk management related to one another. And um, guidelines for auditing and risk assessment, for example, using privacy impact assessments or ethical impact assessments. But such continuous oversight throughout the design life cycle, as well as before and during deployment, provides a framework to evaluate and mitigate the risk and the unintended consequences, provided they include the participation and the expertise and the knowledge of survivors and victim advocates. So in conclusion, we feel that the CSAM case illustrates how design for a very narrow singular purpose, identifying and prosecuting um, perpetrators of crime, K 
can have unintended uh, consequences and violate the human rights of individuals with sometimes devastating and even fatal consequences. So this demands that we shape and design oversight practices that help us to consider broader perspective and identify these potential risks during design before deployment and continuously thereafter. And we suggest that creating the infrastructure to mitigate the harm to children, teens, and other vulnerable populations requires a balancing, of course, of the protection of privacy with important surveillance and enforcement elements and a risk-based participatory design approach that involves multiple stakeholders. By participatory design, I know it's not unknown to you, we mean broadening the stakeholders to include survivors, advocates, social scientists, as well as privacy engineers and law enforcement, and recenter individual autonomy and data protection. And we want to move away from an enforcement model to a risk-based model, including continuous audits to evaluate those unintended risks and harms. And finally, encouraging the funding of research. There's still many untested assumptions and unanswered questions in the field. So in closing, I thank you for your attention. Tatiana and I both do. And we'd also like to thank the um, conference organizers and the staff for their support, as well as the support that we have specifically received from the Computer Research Association CI Fellows Project, and also the opportunity to work together, the three of us, on this issue through our membership through ACM's Tech Policy Committee. And I'm happy to address any questions, all three of us, and I'm going to invite our third author up, Jean Camp from Indiana University, to join me for these questions.